thanks for inviting me so we are on here now okay so okay um let me start the program then um sarwar yes madam we are on the live now we can go okay uh good evening good morning uh, thank you Thank you very much for joining uh, this program. I am Famida Khatun, the Executive Director of the Center for Policy Dialogue, Bangladesh. On behalf of the Center for Policy Dialogue, um, Institute of uh, Policy Studies, uh, Sri Lanka, and the Southern Voice, I welcome you to this webinar, which is titled Recovery of the Apparel um, Sectors of Bangladesh and Sri Lanka from the COVID-19 Crisis. Is a value chain based solution possible? So at the outset, I must mention that today's program is being organized jointly by CPD, IPS and the uh, SB, Southern Voice, and researchers from the Center for Policy Dialogue and Institute of Policy Studies have recently conducted a joint study with the support from the Southern Voice Southern Voice is uh, a network of 51 think tanks of the global uh, south. You might uh, know of this uh, network. So uh, basically, the study has looked into the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the apparel sector. And we know that the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted on the national and global economy severely. And almost all the sectors of the economy have been affected. And global apparel value chain has also experienced disruption from this pandemic. And this, uh, the scale of this disruption is going to be um, severe and very large and huge. And also this is going to have an impact on the, not only on the growth of the economy, but it is also going to have, uh, in, have impact on the employment and income uh, from the short to medium term. And if we do not address uh, the recovery in a sustainable manner, this is going to have a medium term impact on achieving other uh, goals. For example, the sustainable development goals, which are connected to uh, reducing poverty or uh, eliminating poverty, um, having a zero hunger, gender equality, decent work, economic growth, and also the uh, area in the areas of industry, innovation and infrastructure, all these SDGs are going to be um, challenged in view of this impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. And this study, which have been undertaken uh, based on a survey of multiple stakeholders in the sector, this yeah. study analyzed uh, the potential of a value chain based solution to support the recovery of the local apparel sector in view of the ongoing pandemic. And today's uh, webinar has the objective to share the findings of the study with the broader stakeholders, uh, with the policymakers, with the uh, buyers, with the manufacturers, with the uh, workers in the industry, and also the you know, academia and experts uh, to share the insights with them and also uh, get their insights on how to recover the sector in a sustainable manner and how to uh, also undertake responsible business practices. And this is expected from the market, major market players uh, who have a stake um, in also the, in the businesses of the Apple sector in these two countries. So today's, uh, in today's dialogue, we have a number of uh, very important speakers. Uh, the presentations will be made, made by one presentation, which will be made by uh, CPD and um, uh, IPS researchers. And then there is a distinguished panelist. I wouldn't uh, introduce them because uh, we have a moderator. Um, the session is going to be moderated by Professor Mustafizur Rahman, who is the distinguished fellow Center for Policy Dialogue. I would now hand over to him to moderate the session. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Famida. I would like to join uh, Dr. Famide, in extending a warm welcome to uh, all of you uh, on behalf of uh, CPD 
uh, Dr. Famida, our executive director, and uh, also uh, executive director of Institute of Policy Studies, Dr. Dushni. And as Dr. Famida mentioned, uh, our uh, partner is Southern Voice. And uh, uh, I would like to extend warm welcome on behalf of the chair of the Southern Voice, uh, Dr. Devpriya Bhattacharya, and uh, and, uh, Andrea uh, uh, Odinus, she is uh, director of Southern Voice. She is also with us here. So, uh, uh, warm uh, welcome, uh, dear audience. And uh, uh, we do hope that uh, you will be with us uh, because the uh, topic of today's discussion is, is very important. Uh, we are passing through a second wave of uh, COVID. So, uh, how this important sector uh, will uh, sustain uh, this uh, this pandemic and how do we make it a part of uh, building back better uh, that's the um, uh, stake the high stake which is uh, which is here and uh, uh, i think that uh, uh, the topic is very important also in the sense that all the nodal points and the stakeholders along the value chain have been affected uh, by by the pandemic, be it producers, uh, brands and buyers, uh, retailers, consumers, workers, uh, the governments um, involved in our country, all of them, uh, all of us, we have been affected. And we will also need to be part of the solution. So how do we then apportion the responsibilities along the value chain so that we can have a sustainable apparel sector in our countries? And also, uh, uh, we we can uh, look forward uh, to the sustainability of uh, of the apparel sector itself. So, from that perspective, this uh, uh, this is very important. I am uh, very happy to see that uh, we have been joined by uh, our um, distinguished panelists. I will introduce them as we um, go forward. Uh, I can see that uh, CPD. Um, uh, distinguished member, board of uh, trustees, Mr. Saidu Zaman, our former finance minister, uh, he is here with us. I don't know um, our chairman, uh, Professor Eman Subhan, uh, hopefully will also join us. Uh, so uh, as uh, Dr. Famida mentioned, this study is a joint study by the CPD and the IPS. Uh, there is a study team on behalf of the team uh, uh, the presentation will be made by Dr. Kondokar Gulam Mohazim, uh, Research Director, CPD, and uh, Mr. Kitmina Hewaj, uh, Research Economist, uh, IPS. So uh, without much ado, uh, I would like to invite uh, uh, the uh, two presenters uh, to present their findings, Dr. Mohazim and uh, Mr. Kitmina. Uh, thank you, Professor Mustafiz. Uh, it is a, can you share the presentation now? Can you make it a, make it larger? Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, uh, audience, for joining uh, today's very important webinar. Uh, this presentation will jointly be made by myself and Mr. Keith Minahiwage from IPS. Please, next slide. Uh, this is the study team uh, for the study. Myself, Dr. Famida, Kitmina, Tamim, and Anjana were the team. And we especially thanks to Abru and Aisha from IPS for uh, uh, providing uh, necessary supports for uh, various kinds of issues related to the study. Uh, second, yeah, why this study? I think this is uh, important to uh, take into account that uh, it, lots of studies have, have taken place so far uh, 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 with regard to the uh, global value chain, particularly on the ready-made garment value chain. But from that point of view, I think this study is different in the sense it has taken into account a, a whole value chain approach. Uh, instead of actually taking the buyer's uh, concerns or uh, the supplier's concerns, this study actually undertake the study from a more whole value chain point of view, taking to account all the challenges um, confronted by the um, market agents. It has tried to find out the problems and thereby uh, the next point is that uh, try to find out a value chain based solution. This is a different in the sense that usually the solution um, so far approach at a national level 
or uh, at the uh, downstream of the value chain by the buyers and various kinds of solution usually proposed and undertook. Uh, but from that point of, from, uh, from there, this is different in the sense that it is taken a solution from a whole uh, value chain uh, point of view. So let me actually come that point. And my colleague Kitmina will present the five key findings of the study. And based on that, we like to present you some sorts of a framework of cooperation uh, within the value chain, uh, some newer approach, whether we could actually thought of whether brand buyers and suppliers and the sourcing country governments and the supplying country governments jointly undertake some sorts of a newer approach for this uh, longer term um, recovery period, some sorts of a sustainable solution. Next. And we all understand that how the uh, global value chain uh, of the red garment sector has been affected uh, because of the COVID pandemic. And, um, and this, has, this has affected both the upstream and on the, on the downstream of the value chain, uh, both the brand buyers as well as the suppliers and workers all have been affected. Against that, the initiatives undertaken at the national level we found are, seems to be, uh, we found those are uh, inadequate. Um, uh, those are largely short term in nature and have very limited long term impact and implications for the suppliers, for the workers, as well as for other market agents. So from that point of view, I think uh, this is a, uh, is a challenging part when the uh, second phase uh, of Corona pandemic has started and the recovery uh, now appear to be more long longish. Now uh, the challenges are much more deeper and we, th we thought that we need to th uh, uh, take it in a newer perspective. And most importantly, the fiscal constraints of many apparel supplying countries is a major uh, challenge. And you all understand that uh, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Cambodia and, all, and other supplying countries have very limited fiscal capacity to support their workers, to support their entrepreneurs. So uh, they all undertook some, some initiatives, but those are very much of a credit, credit based in nature and are very short termish and very uh, limited impact and implications for longer term uh, pro problems and challenges. And what we are actually currently notice, if this pandemic uh, prolonged and the medium term challenges extended, uh, which, uh, which will cause the demand slump um, at the consumer's end, that will uh, close more uh, shops and um, uh, at the retailer's end, that will affect the buyers and brand strategies. And finally, that will affect the suppliers as well. So need to have a, some sorts of a, uh, innovative approach in terms of uh, medium term recovery. But what the recovery current measures currently undertook, we thought that those are not actually affecting or positively contributing the whole supply chain. We noticed that uh, the, there are inventory smoothening initiatives there are lots of uh, stock of inventory in the suppliers in and buyers to, uh, take initiate, took initiative to smoothen those inventories. Uh, those are of a short term in nature. There are initiatives for reshoring uh, uh, in order to consider the, um, the, the vulnerability in the supply chain. Buyers reshored their, a part of their uh, uh, orders to uh, regional uh, sources. And also the alternate location strategy is also taken by brands buyers uh, to concentrate more reliable fuel sources that also have, uh, have undertaken uh, during this time. And all these are more considered to be of, uh, of a, a downward stream uh, approach or meaning that uh, brands and buyers point of view, those initiatives are quite okay, uh, but more of an individual point of view, those may be sustainable. But what, what about the whole supply chain? Next. And from that point of view, we, we thought that a value chain based solution, something new need to be thought of. And for that, we have proposed here some collective action um, under a market based frame and uh, where the market players will explore solutions uh, which will enable the stakeholders to cope with the crisis, to rebound and recover and to be resilient. So that is the whole theme of it. It will not actually consider an individual um, uh, based solution either at a national level or at, at the uh, buyer's end, but it will consider the whole supply chain together and try to find out some source of a, uh, of a solution. Uh, if it is feasible, we like to hear from the brand buyers representatives here uh, and also from other uh, distinguished panelists, whether these kinds of uh, solution is possible or what sorts of other initiatives could be undertaken along with that. So with these words, I am now actually handed over to uh, Mr. Kitmina to present the five key findings of this study. Thank you, Dr. Mosam. Um, could we move to the next slide, please? Right, uh, so let me present the five key findings from uh, our case, uh, from our research um, that was done. 
The first is a, a lack of preparation on part of suppliers in terms of crisis management and resilience in terms of increasing capacity. Now, of course, COVID-19 was unprecedented. Uh, no one expected it, uh, unless you probably listen to people like Bill Gates about the impending potential for pandemics a few years ago. Uh, but I think the scope of this pandemic was not expected. The, the last previous crisis that we had was the 2008 financial crisis, where we saw a similar domino effect taking place. We are, we are falling de apparel demand or kind of an economic crisis in the developed countries would lead to a domino effect in terms of the cancellation or deferment of orders, a reduction <clears throat> in supplies revenue and layoffs and retrenchment, et cetera. Now, what's one thing that we found here is that companies, regardless of whether they, were, they had adapted after 2008, 2009 or not, were effect, affected. That is not the question. But companies that had taken certain measures to improve their resilience capacity were able to mitigate the impacts much better than companies that did not. So companies which had stocks in advance or kind of had diversified their product basket, et cetera, or, and particularly diversified their export markets, et cetera, were better at adapting to the situation and, re and reducing the impact, the negative impact uh, of the pandemic uh, uh, led uh, issues uh, than companies that did not. Next, next slide, please. The second finding was in terms of the limitation of uh, national level policies because of fiscal constraints. Now, uh, the fiscal constraints of developing countries like Bangladesh and Sri Lanka are well documented. Um, in terms of a comparison, uh, Bangladesh had a wider, broader basket of policy tools available uh, to support the apparel sector. And I think the economy overall, uh, they were able to provide a much more fiscal stimulus uh, to the economy. Whereas Sri Lanka's issues with uh, limited fiscal space and debt is well documented. Uh, so Sri Lanka tended to uh, rely more towards monetary policy and things like debt moratoriums uh, that were rolled over every six months and are now currently in the third rollover uh, of six months right now. There were also short-term working capital loans and subsidized <coughs> rate, um, whereas Bangladesh would also provide things like subsidized credit uh, as workers' wages and so on. However, there were structural issues that would lead to these policies not taking the desired effect. For example, in Bangladesh, we saw uh, subsidized credit support not necessarily flowing into the hands of workers, whereas in Sri Lanka, the things like working capital loans uh, were available only at a limited capacity to certain companies who had the sort of existing banking connections, uh, and also banks were more and more uh, risk averse um, uh, as time progressed and particularly as the pandemic continued. So there were structural issues and particularly small and medium enterprises found it more difficult to access some of these uh, policies uh, that were taking place at the national level. Next slide, please. Uh, the third thing was with regards to the state of the world of work. Now, first and foremost, we saw at a common level, a broad um, a temporary uh, job losses and sometimes uh, some permanent job losses as well. And almost all the companies that we surveyed had wage cuts uh, from the most senior levels uh, to the junior levels. Now, the, the problem with this was that it was not only a matter of uh, export revenue to the company or kind of wage cuts uh, to the workers, but also it also affected the socioeconomic conditions of these workers. So we saw things like increased indebtedness amongst workers uh, because of more borrowings uh, particularly from the informal sector or pawning jewelry, etc., and also a broader reduction and deterioration of their food intake uh, in terms of their family as well as uh, themselves individually. So even though at times the government and at times companies were providing some, uh, uh, some support to these workers, they tended to be limited in scope and, at, and particularly because of the fiscal constraints of both companies as well as governments, this support was short term. So it would uh, last at most about three months. And particularly given the 
uh, way the pandemic has been playing out now, uh, we saw a limitation in terms of how much uh, that support uh, was helpful uh, in regards to that. Secondly, in terms of the regularity of inspecting uh, the health conditions that were implemented in imposed uh, during the pandemic, for example, we saw those, particularly in Sri Lanka, for example, we saw those regulations being um, taken into consideration quite strictly at the outset of the pandemic. However, particularly around the July to August, or July to September period, uh, when the first wave of COVID-19 was under control, um, there, was a, there was a sense of complacency amongst all stakeholders across the supply chain uh, that unfortunately led to the, the second wave uh, that take, took place um, in, in, in the industry and then kind of uh, was part of the industry and the industry uh, uh, across the country as well. So uh, now we've gone back to more strict inspections and so on, but there, there is, a, there's a, there's a, a, a situation where we see some complacency coming in and therefore there, there are regulatory gaps as well. Fourth, next slide, please. In terms of the medium term recovery, this is particularly affected by the second wave. Uh, now this has affected Bangladesh and Sri Lanka somewhat differently uh, because uh, Bangladesh we saw has been able to more or less been able to continue um, uh, their, their production processes uh, amidst the somewhat second wave that has taken place. Uh, whereas Sri Lanka was taking a strict uh, lockdown approach when it came to the second wave, which meant that a lot of companies and there was a lot of disruption uh, to the production process and supply chain, domestic supply chain uh, during from around October onwards. Uh, so this has somewhat affected the ability of Sri Lankan uh, suppliers uh, to provide for um, uh, the, 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 the demand that is coming from other countries. <clears throat> uh, of course, the fact that, uh, next slide please, of course the fact that um, Thing, the, the COVID-19 vaccine coming up uh, has improved, it has, it provides some improvement or some, some hope for improvement. Uh, however, for example, there have been some disruptions uh, to the, the, the vaccine being given. So this is a cause for concern um, and has, is prolonging uh, the issue at hand. Now, one thing that was interesting to note here was the supply chain that occurs from China. Now, if you remember back to when COVID-19 started and China went into lockdown, this was also the more or less the time of the Chinese New Year. So we saw that Sri Lankan suppliers, for example, had excess supply uh, of raw materials at the outset of the pandemic during the January to March period, uh, and therefore was able to kind of address some of the supply constraints that took place when China went into lockdown. Uh, but uh, but that 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 uh, ability or the, or the decision making was somewhat different uh, when it came to uh, Bangladesh at the time. However, once of course China was getting back online, uh, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh and all of the other countries went into lockdown uh, since March onwards. Next slide, please. So overall, uh, we've seen, and the, the final, um, final um, finding uh, is that we've seen limited initiatives undertaken across the value chain. And then this, these initiatives have been more or less uh, been specific to uh, national uh, initiatives or company specific initiatives. So for example, we saw uh, several brands uh, reconfiguring their uh, supply chains or their way of decision making. They have, uh, they have given greater responsibility to the country team, whereas they have downsized their local headquarters team. And also in terms of the usage of online platforms to do things like um, to, to do things like fitons and so on uh, and using e-commerce as well and there is a growing and particularly in, when it came to uh, certain suppliers they are also now trying to cater to the domestic market particularly for Sri Lanka when during that period where we were getting back to normal between July and September um, where the international market was still uh, in lockdown or was suffering uh, uh, exporters were, were trying to uh, realign towards the domestic market to try and support that. We've also seen some initiatives, uh, for example, the ILO DIFC initiative and so on. Um, however, overall, across the value chain, we have seen weaknesses or some somewhat limited scope, and that has led to 
uh, that the domino effect that I spoke about earlier. Uh, so I will now give back um, the uh, floor to Dr. Moses. Uh, thank you, Kitmina. Next slide, please. And from that point of view, I think uh, uh, we understand uh, from uh, Kitmina's presentation that those which have been undertaken so far is uh, much appreciated, but those are not adequate enough for the uh, for the enterprises to continue uh, a prolonged um, case of uh, pandemic, which is now likely to be over a year or more. So we need to have some, some sorts of a solution need to be think internally within the value chain. And our proposal is that whether a value chain based initiative uh, could better distribute the orders within the supply chain and that could contribute more uh, in the recovery process. And what we did for, uh, for this, next slide please. Um, is that we have uh, analyzed the uh, distribution of the orders of, uh, of uh, top 20 major suppliers of meat and oven products uh, during peak pre-COVID period and the COVID uh, period in June uh, 2020. And the, the left side uh, figure shows the distribution of the, uh, of the orders. The left side uh, bar shows the neat products, the upper left hand side shows the neat products distribution. While you see the red figure is showing the China's share, which has during the COVID period has further increased uh, from 35% uh, uh, to 39%. And same is true for some other European countries, Netherlands, Germany, and Italy. Um, that they have also gained a uh, share uh, in the market for the meat products. And you know, this is also true for the oven products as well. Uh, on the other hand, some of the traditional supplying countries has lost their market share. For example, Bangladesh has lost market share of 2% in case of the meat products and 1% in case of the oven products. And the same is for the Sri Lanka. It has lost 1% uh, each market share for meat and oven products uh, in case of the pre-COVID period uh, uh, and, the, in the, and the, during the COVID pandemic period. Uh, next slide, please. So from that point of view, we think that uh, this reshoring strategy that has been undertaken uh, or the alternate con further concentration of China has, uh, has uh, reduced uh, and squeeze the uh, orders to major traditional countries like Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. And if these orders come to these countries uh, at a pre-COVID pre level uh, share distribution, that could help these countries to operate and to provide their workers uh, the wages and to continue their businesses during this uh, challenging period. Uh, and from that point of view, we have done the analysis and we have found that during this period, if the uh, orders from the brand buyers have just uh, retained to the pre-COVID period, a $2 billion worth of orders can be shifted from China to other countries. So you can easily imagine this $2 billion worth of orders can be distributed to uh, the country like Bangladesh and Sri Lanka and Cambodia and in India as well in order to uh, better uh, continue their operations uh, during this period. Um, uh, and uh, more importantly, the, uh, these countries have the capacity to produce uh, these, uh, these orders. Can you go back to the earlier slide? And you see the right side uh, uh, columns. Uh, it, it shows the Bangladesh's performance, uh, top five products uh, uh, in neat products and oven products. And same is true for oven products uh, for Sri Lanka. And here also in all categories of products, China is there and Bangladesh and Sri Lanka has all the capacities to produce those products. So the, these countries have the capacity if the, uh, these orders uh, redistributed to these countries and these <coughs> countries could produce those very well. Next, uh, next slide, uh, next slide. And from that point of view, uh, we think there is a, uh, there is a, uh, uh, the uh, there's a uh, uh, process and uh, there's an alternative to, to think of a joint commitment from the brand's buyer side, particularly from the Europe and USA and from the governments of the sourcing countries to undertake a, some <laughs> sorts of a redistribution of, of the orders, uh, uh, try to gradually return to the pre-COVID level market shares. We know that the consumers are now demanding less, but within that uh, less pie, uh, whether the pre-COVID distribution level could be retained or not. Uh, if that re uh, retention could be possible, then the, uh, these orders could better sub uh, support to the uh, manufacturers of these, uh, these countries. Uh, and we also like to mention here is that sub, uh, the, these countries where the, the, now the orders are going, uh, particularly uh, to China, Vietnam, they are well, uh, they are 
they are uh, they benefited through these orders. But at the same time, we also like to mention that these countries' social support scheme is quite strong. For example, China's social uh, protection scheme has been further uh, widened uh, in order to cover uh, unemployment, uh, unemployed workers and providing the uh, unemployed insurance uh, for these workers for another six months. And for uh, Vietnam also, they have taken a uh, uh, insurance scheme uh, which will cover 50% of the total eligible workers by 2020 and 100% by 2030. So these initiatives will also support these countries like uh, to, uh, to better handle their uh, in initial worker related or empl uh, employers related issues. But countries like Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, which have limited social uh, support programs and which doesn't have cover workers within that social support scheme. For example, there is no such unemployment insurance scheme for the workers except that uh, the recently Bangladesh has initiated it with the support of the European Union and the German support. But uh, there is no such actually extended uh, uh, insurance scheme for these countries. So what we actually like to propose, next slide, uh, is that, uh, 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 next slide. Uh, what we like to propose is that uh, uh, it is a joint collaborative effort is needed from uh, from the suppliers, from the brand buyers, uh, in order to gradually move from, uh, from COVID period to pre-COVID uh, level, uh, the uh, bottom uh, triangle we are showing, uh, by undertaking uh, better redistribution of the orders in one hand, as well as providing various kinds of uh, social su support from the sourcing country government in order to ensure the, uh, the unemployed workers' livelihood uh, concerns, as well as providing training and other facilities in order to uh, uh, explore new uh, uh, employment opportunities uh, during this time of con uh, 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 challenging period. We think that uh, such kinds of redistributive initiatives under a very much of a market-based frame uh, could better facilitate of a longer-term challenge during this medium-term um, uh, concerns uh, in the global apparel value chain. And with these words, I like to conclude here. And thank you for your patient hearing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Moazem. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kitmina, for that excellent presentation. Uh, dear audience, I think uh, uh, we all should appreciate uh, the very insightful uh, observations and analysis that has been presented uh, uh, by Dr. Moazem and Kitmina as part of the study. Uh, well, we appreciate that, uh, that uh, the pandemic has uh, hit all the nodal points along the value chain. Uh, and we also appreciate that the governments and the entrepreneurs trainers uh, um, have limitations with regard to addressing the, the emerging challenges. So from that perspective, uh, what uh, the authors are proposing is, is, a, um, is a very innovative approach, <laughs> I, I must say. I try to follow uh, this discourse and uh, uh, I think that uh, the proposition uh, with regard to uh, you know, helping with extended insurance scheme or not asking for discount or deferring the orders. Uh, I think that's something that, that we can discuss. And we know that companies like H&M have uh, done that. Uh, but, uh, uh, but with regard to the proposal of, uh, of restoring the pre-COVID share uh, through uh, 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 redistribution of orders away from uh, uh, China and Vietnam, uh, will of course require a lot of uh, uh, changes, uh, not from single uh, brand buyer, but as a, as a collective. So uh, these are very uh, interesting proposals. Uh, to what extent these are possible? Uh, that will be one question that I will uh, request my panelists to, uh, uh, to, to think about and, and share their opinion about. Uh, I think this is very innovative, but at the same time, I also understand that it is very challenging also uh, because uh, brands and buyers uh, tend to be guided by competitive prices, uh, but whether uh, in view of COVID, uh, they can change their strategy and go on for more of a social welfare type of uh, a redistributive justice. Uh, uh, so that is something that uh, that that we we will have to think about, and we will request our panelists also to to to, to share their thoughts on. We also have seen how 
the 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 relative uh, you know resilience of bangladesh apple sector and sri lanka apple sector that was also very insightful and interesting so uh, thank you uh, dr mazam thank you uh, kitmina uh, uh, for that excellent presentation uh, we have uh, dear audience uh, five very distinguished uh, panelists with us and uh, i will introduce them as i go uh, forward they include entrepreneurs big and small they include uh, thinkers uh, who have been writing and and advocating sustainability of apparel's value chain and apparel's ecosystem uh, we have representative from one of the major buyers uh, in bangladesh which accounts for i think about 10% of total uh, total business of 33 billion dollar in bangladesh i'm talking about h&m and also we have the ilo which is um, uh, of course doing a lot of uh, uh, work in terms of advancing the interests of um, the workers and all the sector itself so very rich uh, panel and of course we will welcome uh, your uh, comments as well um, and now uh, let me uh, request uh, mr husni sale uh, who is director strategic transformation uh, uh, of mass holdings uh, which is a major uh, mass holdings is a major apparel um, enterprise uh, uh, group in, in in sri lanka and my question uh, to mr husni sale will be mr sale you have heard the uh, the, the the presentation so uh, as an entre entrepreneur uh, and as a group uh, how did your company uh, adjust during the uh, the covid uh, did you get any support from the brands and buyers uh, what, what is your opinion uh, what else they could have done or can do now as we face the second wave of uh, uh, pandemic uh, so if you could share your thoughts uh, in about 7 minutes uh, i will be very grateful sure thank you uh, professor rahman and uh, i uh, just like to start off by uh, appreciating the organizers and uh, uh, the, uh, the presenters of today's discussion for setting up this webinar and uh, i honestly believe that um, forums like this that promote constructive dialogue often pave the way for meaningful change so i'm i'm happy to be a part of it so i think uh, you know if if it if you'd allow me i'd, I'd like to just you know talk a little bit about um, mas's experience uh over the next few minutes in dealing with the pandemic um and also touch on uh by drawing relevance to some of the points that have been raised in uh, in today's discussion right in in what has been proposed uh three broad points uh, for firstly for those of you who um, aren't familiar with MAS uh the organization that I represent is a design to delivery apparel apparel solutions provider um whose core business is in manufacturing apparel or you know ready made garments as as we call it Uh, and we're headquartered in Sri Lanka. Have about 50 manufacturing facilities across 17 countries. We employ about 99,000 people globally, and we manufacture garments uh, for some of the world's leading intimate apparel, sports and swimwear brands like Victoria's Secret, Nike, Lululemon, Speedo, etc. So, um, looking at just three points that I wanted to raise in how. our experience of the pandemic also relates to this value chain based conversation and then i'll get to answering uh, the question that the professor posed as well um firstly the first most i think pertinent point is that any value chain is only as strong as its weakest link um and the overall value that the value chain can create is truly optimized only when stakeholders work collaboratively together and especially during a time of crisis and we experienced this first hand when the pandemic hit us um it didn't just hit us in waves but it hit us mm -hmm. uh, in different parts of the apparel value chain um and for us you know we had uh, initially when china went on lockdown uh, january february of of last year we had raw material disruptions because our suppliers were affected so we couldn't that led to our, our manufacturing plants being open and us not being able to deliver on committed customer orders the second phase was more about our demand side where markets in key markets like the us and eu go into lockdown and uh, then the demand for for orders uh, you know kind of fell off a cliff and so we had open capacity and we had to push back on our suppliers and orders that were live at the time and finally we had a phase where sri lanka went into lockdown uh, where you had our apparel manufacturing facilities uh, coming to a grinding halt despite having live orders to deliver on and supply chain raw materials that were readily available 
So we got hit every which way you can imagine, right? And I think the first point that I raised is, um, you know, it is through the collaborative efforts of these key stakeholders that we were able to navigate through this immediate crisis. Our key customers were flexible. I have to give it where credit is due. Um, our customers were flexible in accepting these delayed deliveries. They worked closely with us in reprioritizing shipments and even encouraged us to leverage the opportunity around digital e-commerce sales, where they gave us you know, some orders and, and helped us align with that opportunity. Uh, suppliers prioritized our raw material for us um, and worked around the clock to improve deliveries. And even our government you know, evolved their approach in managing the pandemic over time across the first, second and third way, uh, first and second waves here in Sri Lanka to ensure that the country not only saved lives, but actually saved livelihoods as well. And that's a fine balance uh, to strike. So we ourselves worked openly. This first point is that we, open, we worked openly and transparently uh, with our stakeholders across the value chain. And we had a trust-based collaborative approach, uh, which was why I, you know, I feel that we were able to minimize the disruption uh, and optimize the value that we created across the value chain during this crisis. So that's point number one, right? We have to work collaboratively uh, to, to, to minimize uh, disruption. The second point is that risk mitigation in the medium term, uh, for me is more about building resilience within the value chain uh, than merely shifting uh, your supply base or you're looking for alternative supply sources like, was, like, like what was presented. While some customers found themselves overexposed um, to a few sourcing countries or organizations during this crisis, the majority of our key brands already had relatively diversified sourcing footprints, right? Uh, however, in, in search of, let's say, operational stability or risk mitigation, in the immediate crisis, some, some customers explored moving orders to new locations, right? And whilst this may provide temporary relief, uh, in the short run, there are no guarantees that the rising COVID infection rates will not pose a, trace, a threat to these new locations in the future, uh, given the evolving nature of the pandemic, um, uh, or that these new sourcing locations wouldn't open up to other risks that are non-COVID related. And, and the cost of switching also is something that is consider, considerable for, for brands uh, to, 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 to think through uh, before making those calls. Right? Um, so with these similar kind of limitations associated with reassuring and re regionalization, the supply chain strategies can be limited in their ability to offer true risk mitigation in the medium term. Instead, building resilience within a relatively diversified but existing value chain, um, you know, such that it has the capability uh, to face both current and future crises successfully, is now increasingly being seen by, by people in the, in, in the value chain as a preferred alternative. So for example, during this crisis, MAS built operational resilience in a number of ways. We strengthened our COVID risk assessment protocol, implemented st strict health and safety SOPs across our businesses. We created bio bubbles and zoning within factory flows. We had factory within factory concepts so that even if one of our team members tested positive, the rest of the factory outside of that zone or that area could, could still operate. So we found ways to you know, optimize our manufacturing capacity across the entire scale of our group and move Two orders minutes. relatively quickly uh, between, between plants, understand. So, um, so with all these different ways in building resilience, we feel that that can truly, building operational stability and resilience can truly be the way through which we achieve risk mitigation over and above moving um, supply locations or other supply chain strategies. The final point is that in any medium term value chain solution, you need to consider what the post crisis value chain is starting to look like and emerging. You know, what are these uh, and what does that mean for stakeholders like us in the value chain? Um, and I think whatever we're proposing as a medium term solve, uh, we need to be cognizant on how the traditional value chain is evolving and what the role on each of, of each of our stakeholders like ourselves will need to play in the future. Otherwise we risk, we risk being disrupted overall. So, you know, in closing, it's a, it's a transformative time for us in the industry. And I think the opportunity to create and capture value is, has never been more profound. And if you look at what the customers and in what is being presented also, what we're asking for is a very good, and I think, uh, you know, a socially acceptable request. Uh, however, if it does not need the, solve the burning problems of all stakeholders, including the customers who also, let's not forget at the start of the pandemic, the statistics said that, key customers were going, uh, about a one third of these customers were going to go out of business. These retail brands were going to go out of business. So it's, it's something that we need to be considerate and understanding of as well as we find the full um, 
solution, a value chain based solution. And so to, to finally just answer the question very briefly that was posed, our customers, we had two types of customers. Some of, most of our key customers chose to partner with us and help build value chain based solutions in terms of how to risk mitigate and face the crisis together, both in the short term as well as looking at the longer term. But there were customers who took a more enterprise centric view um, because it meant their survival, life or death. Uh, and we have to be understanding of that. And I think uh, whether you, most of our customers, whether it come to negotiating lead times or looking at uh, uh, better credit terms, et cetera, there's a bunch of tools that we can work with customers, which I can get, I, get into over maybe the Q&A part of the segment. I don't want to take more time, but I wanted to leave these three points uh, that reflect our experience in relation to the value chain piece that we're discussing today. So thank hand you. it back to you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hosni Saleh. That was really very insightful. Uh, thank you for sharing uh, your experience. And you are very right that the traditional value chain is evolving because of uh, the pandemic. And we must uh, explore opportunities of uh, socially acceptable and socially responsible practices. I think uh, uh, that conclusion is also very important. Thank you so much. Uh, I will now request our uh, second distinguished panelist, Mr. Mustafizuddin, who is founder and CEO of uh, Bangladesh Apparels Exchange. Uh, Mr. Mustafiz is a very powerful voice in terms of advancing the, uh, the cause of sustainable apparel ecosystem, uh, writes a lot. Uh, he is a, uh, a very strong advocate of, uh, of sustainability uh, of the value chain. And I would now like to request uh, Mr. Mustafiz uh, to reflect on uh, your uh, uh, experience uh, and ref uh, uh, with regard to whether uh, the brands and buyers uh, being the being major uh, players in the value chain, uh, have they played their role in the context of uh, COVID and in terms of uh, the sort of uh, resilience uh, and resilient recovery that we are thinking about? Uh, what is your take on that, Mr. Mustafiz? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Actually, um, if uh, I share my experiences, uh, what happened during this pandemic, I will say that uh, this is something which I never thought. And this is something which I, um, I think nobody should ever experience this kind of experiences, what I had already. Customers who are being working like 20 years, 15 years together, within a moment of minute, they just change uh, their entire uh, so-called relationship, partnership, and all the pitch word, what we always used to hear, uh, we will be working together long term. We are like, um, like a family, uh, all these kinds of what. Unfortunately, when the COVID started, all in a sudden, all the orders had been canceled, payment had been delayed, whatever the goods I shipped. I will not share here anything about other experiences or something from uh, my, um, uh, I mean, uh, my personal experiences. I have one customer uh, where I shipped the goods one year already in uh, USA. Still now I had not received more than $2 million of payment. I have one customer which is very famous. All of you know Topshop, Topman, Arcadia Group, $3 million canceled. And the most disappointed and uh, most uh, painful things for me, I had not even get a reply from my so-called long-term partners. Even they had not feel accountability where they talks a lot about accountability that one email we sent to our partners and say, hello Mustafi, this is the things happening. This is the things happened. Can we, can we talk? We talk a lot about in our industry collective bargaining. When it comes to there, we have a lot of advocacy from brands and retailers to do this with our workers. But unfortunately, we don't have the experience from our brands and retailers. We not got only one even an email from them about these issues. So it's a very painful experiences. And uh, uh, we could have overcome this type of situation if we really uh, have a small conversations and a cooperation in between us. And uh, that's the only way uh, to go forward. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a follow up uh, question. Of course, uh, your uh, experience is, uh, I think, a common for many of uh, the entrepreneurs uh, in Bangladesh, and uh, I am sure also uh, for for in, in in Sri Lanka as well. But going forward, do, do you uh, think that it is possible for the uh, major banks and buyers uh, to shift their position given the experience of COVID? Because uh, because it's a it's a collaborative effort which uh, which will be required for the sustainability of the sector. If the entrep entrepreneurs don't survive, the the brands buyers also survive. And now, uh, are you skeptical about uh, going forward as, as uh, skeptical as you have been in, in terms of your experience? Or yeah. there can be there are some hopes. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry to say, maybe all of you will not like it. But I am I am zero hope. I have zero hope. Okay. The reason why I have zero hope: last five years, I spoke ninety four conferences mm -hmm. and and twenty seven countries. At every conferences, whatever the topics I said, I still see when I see my video, when I see my news, I just ask myself what I am doing and what what I really doing. And it's time to reflect on myself what I am doing. Let's talk about COVID. When COVID started, I have an interview in BBC. I have a uh, right and then. People start to talk about it. Then I okay, a guardian. I face lot of social challenges, lots of lots of uh, lots of problems, which I don't want to tell today. But in spite of that, I keep on talking about all these things. One year gone. If you ask me, okay, Mustafa, what had been changed? Nothing. Contact is still the same thing. Payment terms is still the same thing. Lead time is still the same thing. What had been changed? Nothing changed. So I really have a very small hope to do that. And regarding that partnership, when we talk about the partnership, first of all, our banks and retailer have to consider us as a partner. And I have doubt very few buyers and retailers, very few consider manufacturer as their partner. So we can expect these things from our manufacturing partners when they also consider us as a partner. This is Thank my you. thinking. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mustafa. Uh, I think uh, your experience and your insights are, are very important because we know that uh, you have been pursuing the cause of uh, the sector and, and, and the workers and the domestic suppliers for a long time. And, uh, but we still would like to uh, think that your, your last sentence that they will have to consider us as partners. I think that's the window that, that, that we have in going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please be with us. There may be some questions from the audience as well. Uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, uh, Ms. Bino Ukemasinghe. She's co-founder and managing director of the design collective store of uh, in Sri Lanka. Uh, she is a uh, small uh, entrepreneur. Uh, so we, uh, when we talk about uh, the apparel sector, sometimes we concentrate mostly on big suppliers. Uh, but on the other hand, the small players uh, have also been very uh, highly adversely impacted uh, by 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 the pandemic and 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 and. Uh, uh, consequent uh, implications uh, for the value chain. So, uh, uh, Ms. Binu Ikramasinghe, my question will be, uh, as a uh, small uh, supplier, uh, how did you adjust to, to the uh, uh, COVID? Did you uh, get any support from, uh, from uh, your government, from the brands and buyers? Uh, how, how did you cope with, with the challenge? And uh, what are your expectations from the brands and buyers? Um, so to be very honest, in terms of the government, uh, we had applied for the loan, but like what was mentioned in your presentation, not um, so companies who were basically doing, I would say, okay, like as a small company, they weren't really willing to give us a loan unless and until we had a massive amount of collateral to be given to the bank and you know especially during a pandemic we don't necessarily have that kind of a support or we don't have that kind of monetary uh, support at that point so we weren't really able to get a loan but I have to say saying that we, yes we did pull through and yes we are doing okay now 
but it wasn't easy. Like if I want to share a little bit about my experience during the COVID pandemic. Um, so as soon as it happened, first and foremost, none of us really know how to react to this. And as a small company who houses, so my retail store houses over 60 brands who go across clothing. Um, so it's apparel, accessories, shoes, bags, and so on and so forth. And this is more uh, designer inventory as well as, let's say, I wouldn't really go to the mass uh, audience, but like I would say it's a little bit more design oriented. But again, uh, it was interesting to see how customers reacted as well as let's say the suppliers and of course the designers. Because to just start off, I think what we were mostly affected by was the fact that as soon as the pandemic happened, we didn't know how to kind of, uh, even if customers did order and we, our retail stores weren't open, we had online retail, which we had to, within a couple of weeks, we had to kind of put it online, get into e-commerce and kind of start selling online. But at the same time, we didn't have the kind of merchandise that the customers were looking for. And we didn't have a way of getting it manufactured either. So we had to work with what we had. Yes, like what has been said in this research where we talk about how we have diversified into other categories because we had sections like within the store, we instead of uh, in addition to apparel, we also had, let's say other sectors in apparel, which was like, let's say not only like, let's say dresses and things for outgoing things. We also had like loungewear which kind of helped us to kind of cope with the demand to an extent. We also had things which were related to skincare and things like that, which also helped us as well. But it wasn't an easy transition because obviously there was, um, it was an adjustment period, I would say. So after the first uh, lockdown, I would say things did pick up for us quite well. But the second lockdown was very crucial for us because we did not recover from that one. Because as soon as the second lockdown happened, the customers stopped coming. Customers basically got scared as well, and they stopped purchasing. But purchasing, less purchasing also means that the designers are not able to manufacture. Um, so then that basically, like, let's say second lockdown, then obviously the season came up and, you know, things kind of got a little bit better. But then came the problem of the fact that Sri Lanka didn't have enough fabric because obviously my designers, they can't afford to buy tons and tons of fabrics. They can't stock fabric. They didn't have the raw material required for their uh, merchandise. So what happened at one point is that whatever they had, they used up. By the time the lockdowns and all that were getting settled, they had the problem because of the import bans and things, restrictions, they were not able to produce. So at, from one end, they were hampered in terms of like they, uh, they couldn't get sales at the beginning. Now, when the sales are coming, they can't get the sales now because they don't have the uh, fabric required for it. And smaller businesses, like what was said, they are not... Uh, able to adapt as fast because they are known like especially when it comes to designer brands or smaller businesses they're known for a specific type of fabric or they're known for a specific type of embroidery or a color or something like that and for those kind of things it takes a little bit of time to kind of adjust yes the designers did adjust but by the time the designers adjusted the customers had already changed because now we are going with the time where the designers and everybody at the store was concentrating so much on cottons and like, let's say loungewear and things like that. Now they've moved on to, but the customers now have moved on to a different situation in Sri Lanka because, you know, people are going to work and people are, you know, kind of getting out and about and that whole trend has changed. The change in trend happened so fast that even for us as retailers, even after having uh, 50 plus brands, almost 60 brands within a store, even for us to kind of adapt to this, it has been very difficult. But the whole situation with like, let's say the restriction of imports has really not helped us because the designers are not able to find what they require and they can't buy large quantities and the cost of production goes up quite a bit if by chance they need to source everything from within the country itself which is an ideal situation, of course, but it's not a very practical situation. It's a situation that I think the designers would have 
like to get used to over a period of time, but not in such a harsh manner. And I think this is where we stand at the moment. And Thanks. I have to also say that e-commerce was a huge game changer for us because we obviously had e-commerce before and the Sri Lankan customer base, only a very small percentage is actually using mobile phones and starting to purchase and things like that. So for us, I would say e-commerce was also a very uh, good way to go about it, but it took a lot of time. I would say like, let's say the first one month was literally about talking to customers and convincing them. So even after convincing them to purchase something, because of the lockdown, we at most instances, we weren't allowed to like deliver these products. So in terms of like, let's say the whole process, even from a retailer's point of view, the same way the supply chain was very hampered for the manufacturing side of things, even from a retail point of view, we had the same or similar kind of problems because the government was also adapting, I understand, but at the same time, restricting everything didn't really help any of us. There had to be like a, a balance that needed to be struck and also think about the small medium enterprises, which were also trying to function. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be my take on this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bino. I think uh, your uh, perspective is very important uh, uh, because in the apparel uh, sector, there are many small uh, uh, entrepreneurs who cater to the niche market, uh, as, as, uh, as you have mentioned and their uh, uh, you know, capacity to adjust uh, obviously is to that extent uh, limited. You have mentioned about inventory management as a major, uh, major issue, uh, but you have also mentioned about the opportunities of uh, e-commerce, uh, uh, but at the same time you have uh, mentioned that uh, you know, the first wave, yes, you could you know, uh, sort of recover, but then if it is repeated, uh, you know, wave then obviously for a small uh, entrepreneurs, it is uh, that much difficult. Thank you so much for bringing that perspective. I would now like to bring in Mr. Pierre Borzeson. Uh, he is head of sustainability, global production, H&M. As I was telling you, H&M is world's, uh, I think, largest, uh, uh, I think, retail giant. And in Bangladesh, uh, uh, obviously, they are the major uh, players. Uh, uh, they sourced uh, pre-COVID about $3.5 billion, which is about one-tenth of uh, total export of Bangladesh in that world, uh, year of $36 billion. Uh, but at the same time, we also know that H&M uh, uh, stands a bit apart in the sense that it was one of the very few uh, uh, retailers uh, and, and brands which did not cancel orders, uh, which Mr. Mustafizuddin was mentioning, didn't ask for uh, deep discounts, uh, didn't defer their uh, orders, they, they fulfilled their commitment. Uh, so from that perspective, I think it will be very important to hear uh, from uh, a responsible uh, brand like H&M. Uh, uh, Mr. Borgeson, uh, what do you think, uh, can we, uh, learn something from uh, what we are experiencing and we what we have experienced and and some of the proposals that uh, uh, has been uh, mentioned in the uh, paper. Uh, can we have responsible sourcing? Can we uh, uh, look into the interest of uh, of countries like Bangladesh and Sri Lanka and uh, and then reposition uh, ourselves uh, so that. Uh, we don't do business at the cost of uh, the small uh, guys, that, uh, as it were. Um, what will be your take on that? Okay, great. Thank you very much for the introduction there. I just want to make sure that everybody can hear me. Is yes. my sound okay? Yes, yes. Great. And of course, we can learn. There is much to learn in the study, and there's much to learn from this situation. But first of all, I would, of course, like to acknowledge the uh, the, the workforce in, in uh, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, but of course across the global value chain, uh, which is a very vulnerable group of person during a very pressured time like this. Um, coming a little bit to the study, 
And first of all, I would uh, would put it in a context where COVID uh, has, of course, changed things. Some of the things that we have perceived for a long time in the industry that has been necessary to change, but also putting new light to things that are very critical for our industry. Digitalization, for instance, didn't start with the COVID, of course, but it has shown the importance for our full industry, both in the customer offer, but also in the way of doing business in the supply chain, the need for speeding that up and the need for, for accelerating and, and taking action on that. Um, so, so COVID, uh, that's just one of the examples. And COVID has exposed these vulnerabilities that is in our industry, the lack of digitalization, the lack of social protection for the workforce, uh, and sometimes also a, a, a lack of sustainability in many parts of our industry, uh, where the customers have become much more uh, savvy and keen for demanding a sustainable product and a sustainable service from the brands that they are supporting. So uh, COVID has, has shown the importance of speeding up things such as digitalization, uh, such as uh, sustainability and, and creating a positive impact throughout the full value chain. Uh, returning then a little bit to the study here, I think it's important to, to put it in a frame that the world is evolving and changing. Uh, the study speaks about pre-COVID and returning back to pre-COVID. Um, you can say that the industry and of course the world has been disrupted many times, this time with COVID in a very rough and sudden way, an unpredictable way uh, in the sudden moment. But I mean, the industries in, their, in various parts of the world has, has been disrupted many times before. Globalization has changed the way people are behaving in the, in the way global supply chains are working which has in some sense been to the benefit, for instance, to Bangladesh and, and, and Sri Lanka. So I think it's important to speak about COVID not in terms of a sudden thing in history and in future and in the industry, and we need to work back towards uh, how it was in the past, speaking about pre-COVID. I think it's important to look at it as an ever-evolving uh, with its challenges and opportunities. Of course, COVID being a huge challenge for people and industries. Um, but with that said, I think it's important for Bangladesh, Sri Lanka and all the markets to look at how the markets can become much more agile, flexible when it comes to different kind of product diversification and services connected to these products. And of course, also addressing the sustainability, the impact that is requested and demanded by customers. And in that way, transform into something new rather than looking back on what it was in the past. And in that sense, actually, the poss actually achieving the possibility of creating more and different than how it was in the past. That I think is super important for all industries, so also for Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. And again, especially when it comes to these vulnerabilities that has been uh, exposed, such as the lack of social protection, making the workforce so vulnerable and, 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 and lack of payments that we have seen. Uh, and here, of course, like the study is alluding to, the whole value chain system has to work together in long-term partnerships collaboratively in order to, to, to set a new way of doing business. So I, 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 I would like to really emphasize to not speak about rebounding and recovering to the same as in the past, but of course, speaking about resilience in the sense of how do we form an industry that is responding to these kind of needs and necessities going forward, taking all different kind of parties into account, including uh, individuals in the workforce, entrepreneurs as supply chain owners, brands, and how we can work with our purchasing practices practices, being a responsible partner, for instance, standing by the commitments um, that you mentioned here before, but there are other things as well, really making sure that brands and, and, and suppliers and the workforce can stand strong. Uh, to, to give two other examples, uh, 
for instance, a supply chain financing program that H&M has launched and rolling out globally, enabling our long-term partners to, to have access to finance after order delivery uh, already after three days rather than different brands have different payment terms, 60, 70, 80 days and so on, but actually getting payments already after three days to a better interest rate than what local opportunities are often providing. Uh, another example is, is, is something that the H&M Group recently launched, and it's a sustainability linked bond where we are uh, driving investments to cl climate related uh, uh, projects and investments, advancing our industry into climate neutrality, and in that sense can collaborate with partners that have not yet been able to, to, to reinsert their investment money into climate related projects if they have been paused or, or put on hold given the, given the cash flow situation for, for suppliers in, in throughout the, our global supply chain. And this is one way of how we can provide uh, beneficial financing and support uh, financially in order to not stop the development of a more climate resilient supply chain. Um, I'm super happy to take questions or other comments. I'm sorry I've had some connection issues. So if there has been any direct questions to me or H&M group that I represent, please, uh, uh, please repeat them and I'm happy to take on such questions. No, th thank you. Thank you, Ms. Borgeson. Uh, we have heard you loud and clear. And uh, I think that uh, uh, your perspective and your approach, uh, we do appreciate. Uh, you have mentioned about the need for, for adjusting uh, on the part of the entrepreneurs and producers themselves, uh, which is important. And you have said that change is, uh, is, is always there and it's, it's, an, it's an evolving scenario always. Um, and COVID will have to be looked at from that perspective as well. But at the same time, it is also a, a sudden you know, uh, disaster which has befallen and uh, neither the brands nor the entrepreneurs were ready for it. And we have seen uh, also to be honest that uh, how H&M has, uh, has conducted itself and how some of the others, uh, uh, global brands and buyers have conducted their, 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 there is a difference, at least from, from our uh, perspective we have seen. Um, so uh, we appreciate uh, how H&M uh, H &M, uh, uh, has done, uh, and, and, uh, but at the same time, um, obviously we also understand that, uh, that we uh, will have to learn and, and, and also uh, do the adjustments that we require. And you have mentioned about uh, climate neutrality, um, and uh, you have just not mentioned about that, but you have also mentioned how H&M is supporting uh, those, those. And uh, we know that uh, some of the brands, in fact, uh, were guarantors for the loans uh, which our entrepreneurs were taking from the uh, banks. So, so, so the, across the spectrum of, of, of the brands and buyers, we do see also differential, um, you know, uh, conducting during... Um, Can I the, add, um, I would like to mention one more thing here, also addressing yeah. the report mm. in the study where it said that uh, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka can take on the same kind of orders that other markets can do. To some extent that is correct, but it's important again to look at what markets that are offering the best deals, that includes the impact behind these products and, and a positive development for how we can support whether that is chemicals, whether that is climate neutrality, but of course also social protection that again is so clear a, a lack in many of, of, of the markets that we as an industry, as a total value chain has to approach and advance much, much more strongly. Um, so, so again, yeah. and it's important to look at markets, not just from a product perspective and the resilience of creating one product, but rather a resilience from a labor market perspective and what kind of entrepreneurial landscape that is offered from a legal perspective, from an investment perspective, from a skill perspective and so on that can uh, respond to changes in the industry that is coming. Because again, the industry is not going back and forth, but everlasting evolving. Thank you.
Thank you. Yes, we appreciate that. Uh, 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 thank you. Uh, and uh, your last point that uh, I think what the study has proposed about uh, shifting orders, what your perspective is that you are ready to support uh, the uh, entrepreneurs in our countries so that even in the context of a competitive uh, pricing uh, scenario, uh, you have reasons to, to, to source from our countries if they can produce those products, but it will not be uh, just as a, as a charity. That's what I understand. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, Dr. Mozem, is our ILO friend with us? Yes, yes he's here. Okay, okay. Um, uh, so, uh, Mr. Craig Churchill? No, Mr. Uh, Dan Rees. Huh? Mr. Uh, Mr. Dan Rees. Uh, Mr. Dan Rees is uh, Director of Better Work, uh, ILO, and he's uh, uh, with us. Uh, and uh, I think that ILO is a, is a very important uh, player in, 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 in Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and many other countries, because one of the major uh, stakeholder in, the, in this whole value chain uh, is uh, workers. And uh, obviously, uh, I think, one issue which comes up in this type of discussion always is that, uh, well, okay, we are asking the brands and buyers uh, to be more helpful, to be more supportive, but does the incremental uh, benefit automatically uh, uh, pass on to the workers? Uh, because we sometimes uh, argue that please help because, uh, because it will help the workers, it will help the employer. Uh, employment of workers, it will help their livelihoods, it will help their wages, uh, but uh, does it really happen uh, uh, like that? So, uh, so the argument uh, uh, that uh, that if we if the brands and buyers uh, 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 come up with uh, uh, support measures, uh, uh, then it will help uh, not only the sector but also the workers is not automatic. So, uh, 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 Mr. Rees. Uh, from your perspective, uh, uh, we would like to uh, know uh, how do you look at uh, th this argument that uh, that uh, uh, if 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 the brands and buyers are more helpful, uh, then it will also pass on to the welfare of the workers as well. Uh, and what is your experience in the course of uh, COVID uh, with regard to the behavior of the you know, various stakeholders in the value chain? Thank you, um, and thank you to CPD and IPS for the opportunity to participate in the, the event and indeed to the contributors so far. It's been a very interesting discussion and uh, may also offer warm greetings to, to friends and colleagues in, in Bangladesh, particularly as we, we begin the Ramadan period. Um, so first thing I think I'd say, and I guess partly for full disclosure and as a disclaimer, this isn't a policy area where I can really relay an ILO policy position on some of these are new debates and some of these are contested areas between our constituents. But perhaps I can best answer by offering some personal reflections on, as I think you've asked me to do, on um, engagement with industry stakeholders on questions like this over the last 12 months that are really pertinent to, to some of the issues you've touched on in the presentation. Um, so firstly, to say for sure, I, I think the value chain coming together with much greater purpose and, and unity to address some of the, 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 the challenges set out in this presentation um, is, is a, a very important um, uh, area to look at. There's, there's power and I personally believe unexplored potential in bringing together all the businesses in the supply chain and indeed with government and, and workers organizations um, to, to, to tackle some of these issues. If we're talking about um, what's meant by building back better, if we're talking about um, reversing some of the shocking growth in inequality that we've seen over the last year, um, uh, then, then surely um, we need nothing less if we're gonna tackle some of these issues in the medium term and seriously. Um, I've also no doubt that if there are more orders and there's some sort of pact that gives more predictability to manufacturers about future orders and, and order books, um, then um, it makes it far easier to them to be stronger employers and to build longer term systems and social protections and other things. For our, after all, many people have been arguing that for years. 
However, in saying this, I, I also recognize um, some of the skepticism that, that Mustafi has referred to earlier. Um, and um, I, I actually find it quite hard in this moment to comment on the feasibility of the proposal because I think there are many questions and maybe the best thing I can do um, is, to, is to raise some of these questions and, um, and issues. Um, I think the first thing I'd say is that, that, that the new resilience we need to see um, in terms of building back better in places like Bangladesh uh, and indeed Sri Lanka go well beyond the role of business. If we're really talking about establishing um, new, new access to new rights and, and the social protection systems, um, and as I say, uh, you know, um, reversing inequalities, um, a, a step change improvement in wages that you referred to in your opening, then um, I think that this isn't just a supply chain issue, this isn't just a value chain issue, it's, we're talking about some kind of quid pro quo between business and government. And I think it, if that's what you're hinting at, then I think that's a question that needs to be explored. Um, to the point about fiscal stimulus and the, the relative strength of, of, of countries, I think the ILO has estimated that some 95% of the fiscal stimulus that's been deployed in the pandemic so far to, to ease the pain of the economic pain and, and, and to address the health crisis, some 95% of that has been spent in OECD countries. So maybe that tells us all we need to know um, about the relative position of, of countries like Bangladesh. But I, I also think you know, from my conversations with, with, with advice and, and development banks over the last year, another view did emerge that, that there is liquidity on the table for, for some countries, including Bangladesh, that could have been deployed. They've taken a more cautious approach. I think it's fair to say if you look across the lower and middle income countries, I think it's a little bit more nuanced um, than in, in the study. Um, the, um, I think another question that arises for me out of the experience that the ILO side over the last year. Is, is, is to ask a straight question. Is there a contradiction between a sector specific approach um, and, and really addressing um, issues of, of long-term protection and addressing some of these inequalities at the level of the state. There has been a, an issue with um, governments that don't want to just implement these measures in one sector. I've been in situations where we've gained access for, for, for countries where the government has been unwilling to roll that credit because they can't answer employment insurance and all these things that the ILO is pursuing with its member states. So have we lost Mr. Dan Rees? Yes. Moza? Yes, I think we can wait for for a few seconds. I think we can uh, continue and uh, Hello, Mr. Ruiz, can you hear me? I think it will take time for him most of okay. the time like this. Yeah, okay, I think the connection. Okay, uh, thank you. I think uh, uh, if, if uh, the connection is reestablished, we can bring Mr. Ruiz. But I think the last point was making whether a sector specific approach uh, will be enough or there are structural issues that we should attempt. Uh, dear audience, we had excellent uh, and insightful uh, comments uh, based on 
their understanding the approach ex experience the is returned then uh, then are you there yeah you need to unmute yourself yes apologies uh, my internet seemed to collapse yeah. and i know we're running out of time yes please yeah um so maybe just to finish off I'm, i know we're running out yes. of time but i think on the issue of um yeah, where I, I dipped out was I think we do have to face a question of a, of a strong sectoral approach and I strongly believe that actors need to come together but I think some of what's needed in terms of building stronger resilience and stronger rights and a stronger um, a protection floor for workers maybe can't just be addressed at the sector level so I think there's a question about broadening the alliance beyond on, beyond the single sector and then lastly um, you know given the weakness of social protection systems, you know, what's the role of different parties, I think is, is a really important question that you're asking in, uh, um, at this moment in time. And I think, you know, to be brief, I think if you ask the question, why hasn't Bangladesh, for example, got an unemployment benefit system or, or a, um, I suppose a universal um, uh, employment injury scheme? And I think that, you know, for years, I think, there's been a reluctance of the sector to really extend those protections because they talk about fiscal space. They talk about, is the price of the industry willing to bear it? Uh, uh, is the industry going to come with us? So clearly we need to build trust in the sector and cooperation in the sector to achieve that. And clearly we need to build a stronger bridge um, and a longer term plan that gives um, the, um, the, the national constituents, the industry constituents, the confidence that that's something that could be there to stay and to be built sustainably into the, into the industry. And indeed, give everyone the confidence that the institutions that are needed to transparently implement such a system are going to work effectively. And that there's, there's long term trust issues to address. And this kind of approach, I think, is needed in order to get after that. And maybe I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you for those uh, uh, comments. Uh, I think that uh, these are very important. And uh, your point, which uh, I wanted to highlight, is. Uh, is the, your question that whether sector specific approaches will be enough and whether we will have to look beyond. And uh, that's also a very good point to bring in Professor Rahman Sobhan, uh, the founding chairman of CPD. Uh, Sar has uh, always argued that, uh, that uh, the, we will have to look at the deeper uh, issues of uh, injustice, um, both in, in, in country and also along the value chain. So uh, we have uh, 20, 25 minutes for open discussion. Uh, so I'd like to request uh, Sar to share his uh, views uh, briefly. Sir, you need Sarif, to unmute you yourself. Unmute, sir. Sir, you need to unmute yourself. Sir, we did button to the chap. Yeah. I yes. would, yeah. uh, to begin with, yes, uh, I think yes, it sir. is a very interesting study with some very interesting conclusions. Now, the main uh, conclusion which came in with your, uh, uh, with the little uh, des uh, designs you did right at the end as to the solution. I have not seen anyone really address the answers to that in the commentary. Now, if I understood that, uh, what was implied in that conclusion was that there has been some readjustment in the distribution of market shares in the uh, pre and uh, current or post COVID, uh, current COVID period uh, with uh, market gains, particularly in China, but also slightly in Vietnam, and market losses uh, for both Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. And in that third triangle, which was then put on the paper, uh, you attempted to work out a suggested and implied response of re returning to the pre-COVID situation, where the market shares of uh, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka were restored uh, uh, at the expense of China and possibly Vietnam. 
Now, what no one commented upon was how this was to be brought about and the feasibility of such a global restructuring arrangement. Because uh, obviously, uh, two issues are missing in addressing that question. One is, of course, uh, no one from China is participating with us in this discussion and how they would actually respond to such a suggestion obviously remains unclear. But more materially, actually there is no existing global architecture which would in fact actually bring about uh, such a sort of mutual conclave where such an accommodation could actually be worked out because what we are essentially talking about is global demand management where I'm not too sure that too much of that has actually taken place uh, in contemporary history or more specifically in rel relation to any particular uh, big uh, supply chains. So it would be interesting to find out how something like that could be brought about. And here I would be very, I, would have, I was expecting in fact to get some response from the HN, uh, our friend from HNM and also from ILO as to whether ILO would be willing to play an entrepreneurial role in, in bringing together OECD and uh, the other big international buying countries and with the supplying countries to see if such a restructuring of the global demand chain could actually be put together on the one hand and more simply at a market level whether HNM would then, if, we, if such an exercise could not be carried out at the global level, would they be willing to, in fact, do that as one of the biggest buyers in the world? They would, in fact, be able to reaccommodate and restore the status quo ante on the lines actually suggested so that uh, both Bangladesh and Sri Lanka can, in fact, recapture their supply chains because this whole argument was made on the assumption that both Bangladesh and Sri Lanka were fully capable of, in fact, uh, meeting their responsibilities if the demand was actually there, but it had actually been uh, already uh, occupied by China. Now, what the researchers, of course, also missed out, and I've sat in on a lot of the uh, CPD and other dialogues, is to get any satisfactory explanation as to what was actually behind this uh, weak calibration of global market chains uh, moving in the direction of both China and Vietnam at our expense. What were the critical variables which brought that about and how much of the corrective uh, response is within the hands of Bangladesh itself? Uh, this I think would be a very important issue which needs to be researched and I haven't really seen the evidence of that. The, but third issue, which I think remains under-researched um, and no one has really addressed is, is that a lot of uh, discussion has taken place on the impact of uh, the change in the global demand structure uh, and the level of demand on the workers themselves, which is rightly so because they are the most vulnerable and the most victimized. And of course, what we have learned in the presentation is that a critical factor in adjusting to it would, of course, have been if the particular countries had uh, uh, a program in place of unemployment insurance, which could at any rate have provided institutionalized protection rather than ad hoc protection. Now, the uh, ILO friend is, of course, suggested certainly for Bangladesh that this should very much be on the agenda. Now, ideally, Bangladesh would want to have a global unemployment system operating for the entire economy. But certainly for a country which has 80% of its exports uh, attributable to, uh, attributable to gar ready-made garments, at the very least, there should be a tripartite exercise carried out between government employers 
and even for that matter workers to work out a mutually accommodating system of uh, unemployment insurance for this industry to address not just the immediate impact of the COVID crisis, but longer term crises which may or may not arise. And finally, of course, I would like to get some sense. I haven't raised this issue in earlier dialogues, but I think uh, we should all keep this in mind that we do know that the main brunt of the impact has fallen on the workers. No one actually knows the degrees of resilience uh, it enjoyed both by the, uh, uh, by the entrepreneurs, the manufacturers, also the buying chains uh, themselves uh, in terms of how they have coped with these crises. I mean, our, the uh, employees and the shareholders of H&M, for example, uh, standing in the bread line, and are they, uh, are your shareholders in fact uh, facing uh, severe constraints in their income as a consequence of what has been happening? Uh, similarly, what is happening to our entrepreneurs, to people like Mr. Mustafuzidin and others that have over the years the enormous um, earnings that they have had from the ready-made garment business uh, seriously compromise their ability to maintain their current standards of living today uh, as they, they existed in the pre-COVID period or have they somehow managed to go on living because uh, they have got accumulated resources and assets? This is not a question which has been satisfactorily answered certainly in Bangladesh and I imagine anywhere else in the world, but it is a question addressed both to the uh, entrepreneurs yes. side of the supply chain and to also the buyers. I know, for example, that companies like Debenham have gone bankrupt, but others in fact seem to have managed quite well, including I presume H&M. And in fact, uh, what degree of cost have they had to shoulder uh, both at the corporate level and also at the shareholder level in relation to the particular problem that we have faced. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. As always, uh, sir, uh, the three <laughs> research points uh, which you have raised uh, will help us to continue this very important work. And also, uh, you have raised a very important issue about global demand management. Uh, we have uh, seen how the developed countries have uh, uh, you know, uh, Sir ganged up in 1974 and uh, did the multi-fiber arrangement and there was a quota system which was the demand management uh, of, of a sort. And we, uh, we found out that it was against our interest and then the MFA was dismantled in 1995 to 2005. So uh, it can, sir, work uh, could you get a short ways. response from our friend from H&M? Okay, example. okay, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, Mr. Pierre Borgeson, are you there? Yes, I'm here. There has been many uh, uh, good uh, contributions in the conversation here. I'll quickly touch upon a few yeah. of them, knowing that- In two uh, minutes, uh, could you respond to my question? Yeah, yeah. I will do that, yes. Knowing that the time for this event was supposed to end at 9 p.m., uh, I believe, uh, Bangladesh yes. time. Um, there are two things that I will comment on there. I absolutely agree with you that the most vulnerable person has been the workers in the supply chain here. And there are severe inequalities in our global supply chains throughout the world where all stakeholders, brands and buyers included, of course, need to contribute to positive developments in, in a more democratized and a more uh, human rights orientated uh, business and industry. Uh, I absolutely agree on that. So with such a situation as the COVID situation, it becomes prevalent and it becomes severe for, for the workers in the supply chain. Uh, so I'm not to argue that it has not been tough for this group and many other groups. It has absolutely been. 
And with that said, of course, our business, like all the brands, have been severely affected from an economic perspective. During some times, approximately 80% of all our stores were closed and absolutely affecting the demand on our products and services. Um, it, it is still in the aspect of, of uh, uh, the health and living conditions uh, challenges that has been put on the workforce. It is not fair to mention uh, how H&M has canceled dividends and, and uh, decreased wages for senior management and so on. It is not the same context as the people in the supply chain are facing much, much more severe challenges that, uh, that the company economically has achieved uh, or, or gone through, although it's been the toughest time in our history. Uh, so in that sense, you mentioned before that it seems like we have uh, performed well. From a financial perspective, absolutely not. From going through a crisis like this, absolutely, yes, I think we have navigated that. Um, on the study that uh, is also proposing to come together as brands, uh, to go back to pre-COVID levels, particularly in Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. I again want to refer to my thinking around building back better. Uh, and potentially Bangladesh and Sri Lanka should have other levels, higher volumes and so on. But we need to look at how an industry is evolving and how customer behaviors is evolving to something new and nothing that will bounce back to the past. And, and here I think it's to the utmost importance that countries like Bangladesh is working on developing a better labor market where there is collective bargaining agreements in place, where there is better living conditions offered to the workforce, annual review of wages. But of course, also, like I mentioned before, the climate side of it, that production is much, much geared towards circularity and climate neutrality and positivity. So it's not on the expense of our resources in the world. Uh, happy to discuss this more, knowing that the time is short. Uh, yeah. I will end there, though. No, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Borges. Mr. For, uh, for, for, uh, yes. Uh, there is a question from Elizabeth Klein. Yeah. Uh, let me uh, read it here. Given that H&M's earnings for 2020 were 243 million, would the brand be willing to A, contribute more money directly to financial relief for supply chain, B, raise prices to responsible prices to support social safety nets while we are waiting for national social safety nets. Okay. Uh, sure. Uh, yes. So, so I would uh, direct further question that question, for instance, to I'm happy to to get it on email so we can respond more okay. sufficiently on it. It's a large question, super important questions that we absolutely work with. So happy to to address it if the person can contact with me in writing. Thank you. Thank you, Mujim Burgesson. One of the critics is that uh, when we go for living wages, which the brands and buyers promote, when you go for uh, insurance for the workers, which brands and buyers would like us to do. Uh, but if that is reflected in the prices, buyers are not ready to uh, give those prices. So that's a, uh, that's a uh, common criticism, uh, but uh, you must have your own reasonings as well. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, are there any any question from the floor? Yes, Mazen? yes another question from Ms. Aisha. Uh, yes, please. She, she wrote, uh, my question is for ILO colleagues on why the ILO call, <coughs> call to action did not have any contributions from brands. Why does it always fall on governments and taxpayers to bail out workers, but brands never step up even, even though their price points are the ones that keep the workers in poverty and in the pandemic, uh, brands have bounced back to profitability while workers are being pushed towards hunger. So it is for Mr. Mr. Reed, are you there? I am, I'm here intermittently. Um, thank you for your question, Aisha. Um, the call to action has a statement that asks brands to pay uh, their contributions, as you know, in terms of orders. Um, and it maps out a collaboration between the stakeholders uh, to seek greater access to, um, to, 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 to credit in the short term and the building of longer term social protection systems. And the short answer to your question 
is, is why it includes those wordings and those clauses and that mission is because that's what the uh, the stakeholders negotiated when they fashioned this agreement out of the um, uh, at the moment when the pandemic broke. So it's a different proposition to the pay up campaign. It's a different proposition to the ones put forward by NGOs on severance pay. It's absolutely not the same, but it it, it is what it is, and it, it is what it says it is. And I, I really Thank can't you. answer the question any other way, Aisha. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reese. Thank you. Uh, Mazam, any, any other point? Uh, you may ask to raise hand, Mr. Mazam. Yes. Uh, uh, are there anyone uh, who would like to pose questions? Please raise your hand. Can you see anyone, Mazam? No, I, I didn't see any, anyone raising hands. OK. Uh, then uh, we can round up. Mazam, do, do you want to, uh, or any of the panelists, if you want to have one last minute? Uh, if no, then Mazam, would you? Yeah, I think uh, uh, thank you for the panelists for your very interesting uh, intervention. And what uh, major realization from my side is that uh, I need to consider a dynamic point of view, uh, more of a static perspective that I present. I think there, is, there need to have a dynamic context, uh, which I think uh, Mr. Husni initially mentioned, then uh, later Pierre also indicated that. Uh, uh, and uh, what I really appreciate that the agent like a uh, brand like H&M uh, uh, is quite uh, positive uh, to the, uh, the suggestion made, but provided that there are, that, uh, that ha this has have some important uh, uh, social cause, whether it is in terms of the job, in terms of environment, uh, in terms of the social protection like that. So that also a dynamic perspective that I think I, we also need to take into account. And also Sar also, Rema Suvansa, thank you, sir, for your uh, important uh, uh, suggestions. I think we will uh, take those uh, issues into account. I think that will also, uh, some of these things, I think we could also uh, uh, do some more research, particularly why the brand buyers look into uh, China and Vietnam during this period, uh, instead of like countries like Bangladesh. Um, so that we also need to uh, dig more. And Sar also suggested of a global demand management perspective. I think that is an uh, important way uh, this research could uh, could uh, uh, could uh, contribute in the uh, in the future uh, course of discussion. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Mazem, uh, thank you, uh, Kitmina. Uh, thanks uh, to the team uh, of authors of uh, this very important work. And uh, uh, our fellow uh, panelists, uh, I think we had a very good uh, discussion, a lot of uh, insights, a lot of uh, uh, suggestions. Uh, I think that uh, what uh, clearly uh, came out in, in one or two minutes, if I can uh, summarize the takeaway, is, uh, is that there can be uh, two types of solutions. So one is incremental, the other is radical. Uh, I think Mozem and uh, his colleagues started with, ended with a radical solution, which Sar, um, Professor Eman Soban mentioned as global demand management. Uh, that's what will be needed if we want to do that. But uh, my uh, uh, takeaway from the discussion and also uh, the comments of the panelists, either from a point of frustration, uh, as Mr. Mustafizuddin said, or uh, the interventions by others, including our h &M friend, is, is that uh, we are not seeing any, any radical solution. Uh, in, uh, with regard to the last slide uh, uh, that Mozem uh, has, has presented. Uh, the sort of global demand management uh, 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 which, which, which Sarah mentioned, I myself is, is skeptic uh, also that, uh, whether it, that whether it is at all uh, feasible uh, or some will also say desirable, as I was mentioning, um, in 1974, there was an attempt by the developed countries uh, through quota system, and 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 that uh, we had protested, and 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 uh, so uh, there are also various uh, sides of that. Uh, but on the other hand, as Sir also mentioned, uh, uh, we we need to do uh, the homework with regard to safeguarding the interest of the workers uh, through 
uh, insurance schemes through fiscal support. And of course, the brands and buyers have a responsibility uh, with regard to that. As our friend from H&M mentioned, that they are ready to support uh, those, those initiatives. Um, um, but on the other hand, as, uh, uh, as, I, as I was mentioning, and which came up uh, very, uh, I think, explicitly, uh, that, uh, that uh, taking uh, responsibility uh, for bringing back their, uh, I think, that brands and buyers uh, uh, will have their own limitations, I think. Yeah. Uh, the uh, better of them, those uh, will perhaps uh, extend support to some of uh, the initiatives, but um, apportioning markets, uh, coming up with better uh, you know, prices uh, in a competitive environment, whilst others are sourcing from uh, lowest, uh, that is, I think, uh, uh, something which is not sounding very feasible. But on the other hand, I think the supplying countries like Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, if we can have a, a collaborative effort with regard to providing living wages, with regard to floor wages, I think that that can also put pressure on the brands and buyers to come up with uh, better prices. So uh, we uh, leave at that. Uh, thank you very much. Those who have stayed with us, uh, I can still see uh, about 43. We had at uh, height of it, we had uh, about 70. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, the panelists. Uh, thank you, the authors. Thank you, IPS. Uh, thank you, Southern Voice, uh, for the support. Uh, thank you, CPD. And uh, I would like to conclude. Uh, and uh, uh, good night. Thank you. Thank you. OK, thank Mosul, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Mustafa Isbai. Thank you. Thank you, Mustafa Isbai, for thank joining. You. Thank you, Mr. Hosni, <laughs> for joining. Thanks very much. Good night, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Good night.